this is kind of a great follow-up to what Aditi had presented on um, because she talked about radiation as a killer. But in my presentation, we're kind of gonna be asking whether it can be a killer or a creator of life. And so, hi, I'm Rita Kamenetsky. I am a senior at the University of Colorado Boulder. The mentor that I worked for this past summer was Demetra Autry. And um, I worked with a group of other fellow students on this project. All right, so the first question that I wanna ask is what is life? And while there are some key indicators to define what life is, it should have the ability to grow, um, to reproduce, to adapt, to metabolize. However, kind of these sections and these boxes that we put life into can be constraining. For example, a virus, it kind of lies on that zone of what life is. It completely relies on its host in order to reproduce. And it kind of seems like just an organized collaboration of chemical reactions. So that one we can see why there could be a great area for. However, there's something like a donkey and it's completely infertile. It does not have the ability to reproduce, to adapt in a Darwinian evolution sense. And so we're already finding holes in the idea of what life is here on earth. And so a fun question to go into to further examine what life is, is to ask what is life as we don't know it? And this is an interesting question because it pushes the boundaries of biology and makes us really look into what powers us and what allows life to sustain itself in order to go forth. It also, it also fosters a lot of creativity and ingenuity which is the reason why I was drawn towards it is because it kind of brought in a theoretical biology aspect into it. It's also kind of the whole point of science. We have to push what we don't know in order to better understand what we do. And it expands our search for life beyond what we know it. Um, here on Earth, we have an abundance of life, but we are what, just one planet, and our sample size for life on a planet is n equals one. As a statistician, and that is a rubbish sample size. So if we want to expand where life can be, not just based on our own preconceptions of how far away from the sun, what atmosphere, the types of biomolecules available, it would be good to know the possible other directions and when and what life can be made. And so already life has surprised us here on earth. We may just be an N equals one, but we've already been surprised by where life has been able to prosper and grow in the most inhospitable places. For instance, hydrothermal vents deep below the sea where no visible life can attain it, we have found a plethora of microbe environments. Not only did we find that life could be sustained there, but we also found that that could be the possible origins for life as we know it. Additionally, one of the largest man-made disasters that happened here on earth was Chernobyl, completely an inhospitable place um, for life currently. However, we had found that there were fungi that began to grow in the nuclear reactors in Chernobyl. And so this ionizing radiation, um, there were higher rates of it, but it also led to higher rates of growth in these fungi. And so you probably remember ionizing radiation from my title slide. Well, what is it? Ionizing radiation is a form of energy that has a high enough energy to bump off an electron from an atom, therefore leaving a radical atom, which only has one electron on its valence shell and making it very, very, very reactive. It also pushes that other electron off, therefore creating a plethora of other reactions. And so in my metaphor for today, I will be using ionizing radiation kind of like a frog prince. On the outside, it looks like a frog, Radiation is synonymous to destruction, to the killer of life. Its high energy breaks apart DNA, specifically the disulfide bonds that connects um, the nucleotides in there. It also breaks down proteins, which can even have a more harmful effect as newer research has shown. It also creates extremely reactive oxygen species. So those radicals that I had mentioned before, they can begin reacting with other molecules inside your body and just create complete havoc inside your body. And so we've shown two effects in which radiation has, and we can also see that life through um, natural evolution has created shields from high energy, such as melanin, which has been used to shield itself from high energy, such as UV. However, I would like to challenge this notion that is simply just a frog and say that it can also be a prince in which that radiation can create life. And many articles in the astrobiological community have shown this, um, one of which was Adam 2021, 
Eshenetic could create more favorable pathways for prebiotic molecules. So perhaps those radicals aren't great for when we have a body in which we expect certain reactions to happen. But if we want to create new molecules that are the foundation of life as we know it, perhaps we need reactions that wouldn't normally occur. And so radiation could lead to these radicals that can lower down that activation energy and to create more prebiotic molecules, such as amino acids, nucleotides, things that we don't naturally see occurring in just our ocean without um, life around it. Additionally, it can produce molecules that can be used as reducing agents. So a lot of these electrons are knocked off molecules. These radicals can join in with one another. But a lot of these radicals um, of molecules that join in with one another need more electrons still. And so those can be used as reducing agents that can actually be used to help power a metabolism. Almost every metabolism we know of needs some sort of reduction that gives us energy. And so that could be another use in which radiation can create life. And additionally, even though there can be high radiation, perhaps the environment of which the life form is in can help dissipate that high energy lead to a lower energy that then could be used by the um, life form. And so ionizing radiation, let's look at how it could possibly be a creator. And so my group this past summer had looked at two possible ways in which it could be done. One was through water radiolysis, and then another was energy dissipation through an ice layer. Now, when we were looking at both of these um, circumstances, we wanted to create optimal conditions. Um, being made in oceans or in liquid is extremely ideal because it allows for the diffusion of biomolecules, allows for membrane building to occur. We can imagine land mass. You can see that it's kind of sandwiched. All these elements are sandwiched from one another. So if the tomato layer needs to mix with the bread layer, it can't do it as easily than if it was in a liquid state in which it was kind of like a soup where all these molecules can react with one another and perhaps create molecules that we would need to sustain life. And so let's go into our first um, exploration of how ionizing radiation could power life, and that is through water radiolysis. So water radiolysis, you can imagine it, a water molecule is innocent, happily floating in whatever environment it is, and boom, it gets struck by ionizing radiation. And so what it can create is a radical molecule that then can create other radical molecules or can create hydrogen gas, another radical molecule, or it can create um, an H2O molecule that is positively charged and a free floating electron. I want y'all to remember that. And so what we based this idea off of was um, a paper made by Altair in 2018. And his proposition was that radioactive decay by elements in the ocean um, could lead to water radiolysis. And this radioactive decay would then create these reducing molecules such as H2, which could power a metallic metabolism. However, what we wanted to take a new spin on this idea was a instead of the radioactive decay and ionizing radiation stemming from the ground for it to stem from space. And this was um, a figure I got from NASA. These are the types of radiation in space. So we can get all sorts of ionizing radiation from space, galactic cosmic radiation, radiation from magnetospheres, solar energetic particles from maybe more active suns than our own. And instead of that water radiolysis being started from radioactive decay, instead being activated by um, ionizing radiation from space. Additionally, what we wanted to look at is that instead of life utilizing this reducing agent um, just for metabolism, it to use these electrons that it was separated from the water molecule. And so these solvated electrons can be used directly as um, energy acquisition. And so this is called direct electrophene, and this has been performed by microbes here on Earth, so it is completely possible in doing. Um, they actually uptake these electrons and use them as energy through um, a cascade, and we could see a process such as one that we have seen here on Earth, but perhaps we could also see different processes, different types of cascades, such as one that we see in photosynthesis, but circumventing that light harvesting mechanism that photosynthesis is well known for. Going on to another exploration that we wanted to see of applying ionizing radiation power life. Um, we wanted to keep that same idea of using an ocean or a water layer 
However, let's say that there's an ice layer on top of that. And we have seen that in many planets um, here in our own solar system, such as Europa, which has a water ice layer and an ocean beneath it. Triton with a nitrogen ice layer. We, ice is extremely abundant in space in general. So that is promising first off. And so our idea was we base it off of the Stelmach um, paper written in 2018. And he had proposed that that same radiation that can stem from space hits this ice layer. And instead of creating this um, electrons, it would actually, the energy from that um, ionizing radiation would create a cascade of electrons. It would kind of break apart all these electrons into secondary particles. And then those electrons could be directly used, kind of what we saw in the last slide of also direct electrophy. And so our new take that we wanted to present on another possibility of how this could be used. In this paper, they used a water ice layer, but we wanted to expand that further. And these are the calculations that we got from a water ice layer. These are the fluxes and the secondary electrons that were made and the biomass that could be sustained off of it. So the biomass can be sustained off of an ice layer that dissipates the ionizing radiation. But we wanted to see, can this work under different environments and specifically a different type of ice layer? And so Michael May, which was um, another YSP participant in our group had performed these calculations. And we had found that the biomass that could be sustained from a carbon dioxide ice layer would actually sustain a higher amount of biomass than a water ice layer. So you may ask, well, why do we care about a carbon dioxide ice layer? Well, our nearby neighbor of Mars actually has carbon dioxide um, uh, ice poles on the top of its planet. And so perhaps we can find little pockets of liquid underneath those polar caps that could give the same um, type of environment that we could see um, with that ice layer in that ocean. And so overall, do not judge a destructive acquisition of energy at first glance. Not all of them are so bad, um, no. But really, what I got from this project and what I hope um, you were able to get from as well is becoming aware of our own biases on N equals one. In all of science, all that we know about life around us is based off of what we can see. But at the end of the day, we are still a small sample size. And every time that we would be doing um, ideas or going down rabbit holes, I would often check to see if this already happened on Earth and that gave it validity. But perhaps that's not the direction we need to go, especially for an astrobiologist. So I became a lot more aware of my own biases. Um, additionally, from this exploration of ionizing radiation and its ability to be a creator of life, we can expand our search for life. So I've mentioned that Mars, now we could further explore those polar um, carbon dioxide ice caps and see if there would be a possibility of life for there. And if we know further about the types of mechanisms that could be supported, we would know exactly where to go to search for life. Additionally, that would help us in our search in other distant planets such as Europa, Triton, that also have those ice layers in that ocean underneath. And finally, we stretch the limits of what life can be. Because when we explore more unchart uncharted territory and biology, we understand more about our own mechanics of life. When you explore what is beyond us, we can begin to understand better of what is within us. And that is all. Thank you so much. I want to thank the Achi Lab and Blue Marble Space for helping me find this project. Yay, great job, Rita. Um, that was awesome. If there are questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or raise your hand as usual. Um, I love this idea, you know, a high energy acquisition um, can also change life. You know, we, we are star stuff, but we're, we're also supernova stuff and we're nuclear bomb stuff and we're cosmic ray spallation stuff, um, you know, and like mass extinctions in Earth's history have actually driven evolution. And so a question I have for you um, to speculate uh, do you think exoplanets that have far more radiation in their environment in general um, from the subsurface, as well as things like secondary electrons moving through ices, do you think such worlds are more likely to have faster and more diverse evolutionary processes, or do you think they'll be limited by that radiation environment? That is kind of the whole pinnacle of um, the the question. And again, it's hard because I keep on going back to, well, life has began here on Earth. So 
this seems like it has the most possibility of sustaining life. And I keep on going back to that, but kind of this whole exploration has shown, especially with the ability to create more prebiotic molecules, that's what especially turned me over into perhaps that can actually expedite the process um, for creating life. And if more genetic um, mutations are happening with radiation, perhaps more can change at a faster rate, exactly as you said. And what we wanted to explore but didn't really get into depth was, was perhaps they're based not on a DNA world. Perhaps they have something way more um, resilient to radiation and that can lead to more stability. And so, there's a lot of what ifs, but yeah, I also don't have an answer, but it is fun to think about. I mean, that's the fun of astrobiology, right? It's, it's we, we get to speculate. We get to go from science to science fiction pretty easily. Yes. Uh, we have two questions. So I'll call on Tim first. Uh, Tim, if you'd like to unmute, you can. Hello, um, I just had a question. So I was thinking since water radiolysis can create protons and most life, all life probably on Earth, uses proton gradients for uh, synthesizing ATP and obtaining energy. Do you think that uh, like abundance of ionizing radiation could have contributed somehow to the origins, like very, very early origins of that, uh, of this mechanism, like of usage of proton gradients? That is definitely a great question. Um, I looked a lot into proton gradient pumps, and as far as I could know it is that the great thing about having protons as a proton pump is that it's very small and it's in great abundance. So that could be a great possibility of having that. Um, from what I understand is that Yes, there are. There is a larger possibility because in hydrothermal vents, they have found that there are a lot more protons um, that have been found there that help power life. I don't know exactly if it would help ex with the proton diffusion because that's a bit later in evolution that that was created. It might not have been in the beginning of life. So perhaps, perhaps not. But I would say a little bit less unlikely. Sanjoy, you have your hand up. Thank you, and great talk, Rita. Really, really interesting. Uh, this, this question follows a little bit that from Tim, um, you know, talking about water hydrolysis, creating hydrogen. That's great for biology, but I was thinking always, well, you need another substance, a more oxidized substance that can then react with hydrogen to form something, uh, you know, to create a metabolism. So, but then you, you answered that by talking about the Martian carbon dioxide polar cap, because if you have a little bit of water pocket inside the CO2 ice, then by diffusion, you will get some CO2 in the water, and then you have hydrogen produced by uh, hydrolysis, um, then you have the energy available there for biology. And if, you have, if you're in contact with some rock on the, on the bedrock or something, that could create an environment that's kind of unique. And I've never seen that in the literature ever. So there's something there. Uh, to investigate, but my question, however, is different. <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't quite follow how you went from available energy to biomass in the table. Like, how did you jump from one to the other? Yes, um, it is a tough equation. It took us probably a month in order to understand it. What they went from was looking at the flux of particles, looking at the energy of those flux, looking at the secondary electrons that could be created from that. And there was this odd definition of biomass density that was based off of flux. And it used, I'm a little, still a little shaky on exactly how they were able to jump from biomass to flux. It was like an erroneous equation type of relation from one to the other. And so I know it was based off biomass density in a paper, but I am not too sure on the exact mechanics. That's interesting. The, the rule of thumb that I've been using is that it takes between, for E. coli at least, it takes between 50 and 150 kilojoules to produce one gram biomass. So I'm just, I'm always looking for those relationships. It's going from like energy availability, which you can calculate from environmental conditions, right. to the conclusions about biological abundance using that relationship. I think it's really cool. Um, but I haven't found really many ways to do that translation. So I'd be curious to learn more about that equation you guys figured out. I could definitely send you the paper that we based it off of. Um.